Well, that's certainly one of the things that we did was to try and ascertain where the factories are located that have been affected. Um, for example, I didn't mention this in the presentation, but I have a large investment in a company who has a, um, a whole lot, a lot of factories. In fact, it's called Hitachi City, and that's within uh, 120 kilometers or so of the of the uh, nuclear facility Daiichi Fukushima. And the worry is that when that happened, that the fallout would be dispersed over the city, and, it, and if it became radio active then there goes all your production that was the you know the, the worst case scenario and of course it's always the worst case scenario that drives the prices and so forth but many of the factories uh, um, for industrial Japan are not anywhere near these these affected areas there's been one or two but they're, they're inconsequential to the total production cycle what uh, impacted uh, largely some companies was the automotive components where one company, Renesis, has 40% of the market and it lost some production due to the earthquake, not the tsunami. Uh, and that uh, had, to, so it had to bring that production back up. And I have to go back to maybe one fact, maybe one factory affected by the tsunami. I need to just double check on that. But the worry here was that you'd have a period of a uh, couple months where you have below average production. So you'd have a supply shortage because there wasn't sufficient inventory of, of uh, parts uh, and components for the automotive sector. So that's the fear factor that drove many of the automotive stocks down. Uh, the reality is that uh, Renesis announced uh, return to production on some of its factories far quicker than people had anticipated. And so this concern about component shortage uh, was um, dealt with and as a consequence, you saw some of the stocks rally back. Now, the big question is, to, to what degree are the earnings going to be impacted? We know they're going to be impacted. They're not going to be impacted probably as worse as people thought. Now it's a question of where we fall. And maybe that's a neat point because you know, the reality is uh, the production profile probably will be up and running fully by the summer. There's another element here too that's uh, contributed to the uncertainty and that's the power averages because with the Daiichi nuclear plant uh, affected, uh, they can't bring sufficient power back on, even if they use traditional measures. There's some excess power uh, on the west, but because it's in a different cycle, it's hard to bring that over, which is, again, something you, know, you, you learn about. Not, was never talked about a great deal. So there, there is a little bit of a concern there with, res with respect to, do you have sufficient power, even if your factory is capable, to, to run the factory? So there'll be some rolling uh, blackouts, I think, and my, my sense is that what I can gather is that the Japanese will just optimize their production schedules as a result of this. Well, I, I think that's just going towards uh, making sure that the people who have been displaced can get a home and, and build, build some infrastructure back. And that's temporary. Then you, then you have the, the longer range plans like some of these cities, now what? Okay, we've had a city that's been wiped out to a large degree, what should we do? And I think people need to sit back and look at the longer term picture because some of these cities were in decline. So maybe they need to rethink as to, you know, to what degree do they rebuild the city? And sadly, populations of that city have been lost. So you don't have to build as much now because you've lost people. But I, I don't know which direction that goes really. That's a complicated subject, I mean, because you're talking about you're not talking about a family, you're talking about generations, you're talking about you know, people's lifestyles and, and so forth. Um, but I think a lot of the reconstruction budget, which, you know, different numbers depending on, on who you talk to and so forth, uh, but that, that's going to take place over the next year. The worry in Japan is, okay, now how do you really fund it given that you have such a large deficit already? And fortunately for Japan, they have a very large savings pool, so it's not that they have to go externally to, to borrow. Uh, and I think that's a saving grace. But having said that, the, the, the actual debt to GDP is alarmingly high. Probably says a lot about how low GDP is, too, in Japan. So I think they, uh, in Japan, they, there's going to be a growth spurt to this, for sure. And my question is, what happens after that?
and to, to a large degree that that's what will impact equity prices longer term but I, I think what I was saying earlier about the dollar and what held back the market after the Great Henshin earthquake in 1995 was the strength of the yen it's difficult for me to build a case for the yen appreciating anywhere near the amount that it did back in 1995 and secondly very importantly the market's valuation so this is why I'm encouraged not just valuation but the returns that you're generating off the cash flows prior to this were very very you know I don't say very high but they were high as they've ever been and yet the valuation is at the lowest it's been in 15-20 years so when I compare that to the multiples or and I'm paying for a given cash flow in the US or Europe, I find Japan attractive from a risk perspective. And actually a return perspective. So that balance between downside risk and upside return to me is best in Japan versus other developed markets. The inflation is cyclical. And each time you have a bout of inflation, it's going to set a new high. So every time inflation comes back, it'll be a little bit more fierce, a little bit more tenacious, a little bit more lasting. I think that's going to be the characteristic for the next few years. I'd be very surprised if we express inflation through CPI, that the CPI would be sequentially lower year after year after year. Uh, my, my expectation is that it probably is higher year after year and, f and it will feature high, higher flash points during the year. Case in point, this year's inflation, if you look at China, it's reached a higher point than it did the year before when we had a food inflation. And I think that's going to be characteristic of inflation through much of the region over the next several years. It's not to suggest that inflation is going to get out of control, it's just going to present a different set of problems for policymakers over the course of the next few years, that they will have to be maybe a little bit more proactive in how they deal with inflation. Maybe the economy becomes a little bit more cyclical as a consequence of those policy decisions. Another reason that you have to be a little bit concerned about inflation is that in Asia, output gaps have narrowed significantly. So there's very little operating leverage right now uh, in the system. So that if if, if you had spurts in demand and you had limited capacity, that usually feeds through into higher prices for a given quantity of goods. That hasn't really materialized, but it potentially could be another source of inflation. Then you have the labor, which has been growing uh, in China, labor expressed through wage rates. Obviously, inflation Sustained inflation is not, not very good for bonds and it isn't really that good for equities either. Sustained higher inflation. I think uh, the initially inflation is going to probably be a little bit more troublesome for bonds than it will be for equities. The difficult, it's hard to say what that flash point will be, or let's call it a tipping point where inflation becomes a problem for equities. Historically, in the US, it's north of 5%. Right now, obviously, if you had 5% inflation with interest rates where they are, that's you know, negative real rates. It's a real issue. Real issue. Uh, and that erodes a lot of purchasing power. Right? So I, I think right now what we need to do is, is you know, just keep an eye on, on where inflation is going. But for the moment, inflation, if it has spurts like 5 or 6, but the annualized inflation is less than 5, I think equity markets can still perform in that environment. Not all, but certainly some cyclical equities could do quite well in that environment. I have the ability to use derivatives, yes. Um, but at the market level, not at the stock level currently. We're investigating maybe the ability to do um, options on certain individual securities. I, I advocate a call writing strategy to take advantage of volatility, but 
you know, volatility can come about through different ways, and inflation is just one of those ways. But we do have the ability to use derivatives to hedge out certain risks. I'll use them. I'll use them when it makes sense. When when a particular uh, security or market becomes quite expensive, um, and let's say let's create a scenario here where I'd use derivatives. I'm in, invested in equities. Let's say three quarters equities, quarter bonds. The equity market begins to look expensive. I look at my individual securities, they're getting close to price targets. It's hard for me to build an investment case that would warrant a higher price target. Then when I look at bonds, they seem to have a similar risk return profile, convertibles. Um, so where do I go? Everything looks expensive. That's a time when I would use derivatives to hedge out the, the, uh, excuse me, the risk. Partly because uh, in the fund I can only go to 50% cash. So in, if I took an extreme scenario, I would sell half the portfolio, the other half I would hedge. But that's, a, that's an extreme circumstance, so I <laughs> never come close to doing anything like that. But that, at least it gives you an example of the type of scenario whereby derivatives could get used.